So I want you to ask yourself this question. We're uh, continuing our Romans series. We're in Romans chapter 10. But ask yourself this question. Why do I go to church? Why did you come to church today? And I know we're in a crazy time. In the, in the 8 o'clock service, we had about four or five families or couples that hadn't been to church. And I'm looking out, seeing some new faces today, too. That hadn't been to church in this building for a year. And I know it's kind of crazy time, and there's people who are joining online right now. We want to welcome you. Glad you guys are there and our people that are in the mask on service. Um, but even though you can't come, you're joining us today. Ask, why do I go to church? Here's what I can tell you. Most people, I think, in your mind, you're already ahead of me, and you're saying, I go, I go to church to worship God. Let me, let me challenge you just a little bit. Paul said, Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, give thanks to the Lord. He said in Romans 12, 1, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. What he's saying is your life, everything that you do, every day of the week, whatever you do, your life and how you live, your attitude, your actions, your words, should give praise to God. God should be glorified in everything that you do. So while it's not wrong to say I come to church to worship, listen, worship, worshiping God should be something every day, all day long that we do and how we live our life and what we say and what we do. How many of you are in agreement with me? That's just the way it is. So coming to church to worship, you don't need to come to church to worship. There's a whole lot of reasons why people would come to church. I mean, and we could go through a long list, and I, I, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip to the punchline. Because you might come for community, and community is a, a, a right reason to come to church, to be connected with other people where you can be encouraged. But going to church, um, a reason to get out of bed and go to church on Sunday, the writer of Hebrews spells it out. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, if you're taking notes, or uh, the scripture is going to be on the screen. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, capital D, approaching. That day, the day when Jesus returns for his church. We need to come together so that we can encourage one another. Here's the deal. The world out there, it's changing. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the climate of the culture around us Outside in the world, it's changing. And listen, if we're putting our, our hope in, in politics or in governments or in uh, e- the economy or whatever it is, we're going to be sorely disappointed. The world is changing. It's not looking this every day. We don't know what's going to happen. But here's the deal. When we come together like this, it's kind of like a roll call. So here we are, you come, and we've got a mission, we've got an assignment, we've come to encourage one another because what's going to happen is we're going to hit the streets from here, and we won't be able to hang out with each other. So we come to encourage and be encouraged. And that's what I want to challenge you with this morning. The the writer of Hebrews also says in 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, capital T, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness today capital t is right now this moment immediately most most of our anxieties come from uh what what lies in our future or maybe something that happened in our past but here's what i can tell you and you've already figured this out what happened in your past and what's going to happen tomorrow you have zero control you can't change what's happened you can't do anything about tomorrow but you have right now So while it's right now, while it's today, while you're here, maybe you're at home and you're in your living, encourage someone. Encourage each other in your faith. We need that. That's what I hope you get from today, that you get some encouragement to say, I'm on a mission here and I've got to be encouraged so that I can be faithful to do what God's called me to do. Today, right now, this moment, we would be hard pressed to read the New Testament And come to a conclusion or believe that we don't need the church. We need each other. You you need the people around you. And they need you. And so I'm, I'm so anxious where we can get past the virus and it's safe. People feel more safe to get out and come here because we need each other. We need to be together. So let's pray. Let's pray harder than ever that, that God would just open 
the, the doors, open the floodgates so that we can, and I'm believing for really an outpouring of God's spirit. I'm believing for revival of, of people and bodies that are, are able to come to the church, people that are gonna be saved out on the street, people that will be saved there will come here to, to, to meet and get connected and, and share community together. I'm believing for a, for, a, for a revival. How many of you are with me? Let's pray, let's see that happen. God's called us to, to, love, to love him and love people. Jesus said the greatest commandment, love God, love people. And we do that in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 25, when you've done it to the least of them, you've done it to him. So as we serve and meet people's needs, really what we're doing is we're loving God. And this church does an amazing job supporting missionaries, incredible missionaries. We're praying for you and we're believing for, for great things, for what's going to happen in your country and through your ministry. Taking the gospel to places where people have never heard Jesus. I believe more and more we're living in a country where more and more people don't know the name Jesus and don't know what it means to have a relationship with him and are missing out on the opportunity to, to, to experience that. But whether we're building tabernacles in Africa or water wells or classrooms and clinics in El Salvador or uh, food at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you know, this church does an amazing job reaching out and loving people. But if all we do as a church or as individuals meet, is meeting the physical needs of people, but we don't help meet the spiritual needs by reaching out to the lost, to unsaved people by sharing the good news of Jesus, have we really truly loved them? You see, I think the, the, the great thing about building a tabernacle in Africa is I, my understanding is that when they put that tabernacle up, which is just basically a pole barn with a roof on it, that the next week the church almost doubles in size. That when they put up a water well, people come from, from miles away and it's built right next to a church where they're coming to get their physical needs met, but there's an opportunity for them to, to receive Jesus. So we're, we're meeting physical needs and bringing Jesus to them. But if we're not bringing Jesus to people, are we really loving them? We're in Romans chapter 10. If you've got your Bibles, you can follow along or you can follow along on the screen this morning. I'm reading chapter 10, starting at verse 5 in the New Living Translation. And it addresses this this issue this morning. Verse 5, it says, For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, Don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says, The message is very close at hand. It's on your lips and it's in your heart. You have access to that message, the good news, the gospel, salvation through faith in Jesus. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach, Paul says. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an amazing an amazing statement. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, no matter what your, your background is, no matter what your nationality is, he's saying Jew, Gentile, all the same. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the very next verse has a three-letter word called but. So there is a but to this. Should make us sit up and take notice. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. So faith comes by hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. We were reminded last week that without faith it's impossible to please God. But we know that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So it's easy for us to think this scripture just applies to, to preachers or missionaries or evangelists. But I want, I want to ask you this question, who was Romans written to? Romans was written to the church, the church in Rome. It wasn't written to preachers or evangelists. It was written to the church, so it applies to everyone. And this scripture applies to New Hope Assembly of God in Urbandale, Iowa today. 
And it's not just the job of one person or a pastoral team. It's the responsibility of every follower of Jesus to introduce people to him. It's all of us together. If you are a believer in Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, you have him in your heart and life, he's your savior and Lord, then this applies to you. You are called. We've all been called to go, whether it's next door, across the street, to a family member, a co-worker, or to another country. We've all been commissioned to go and make disciples. We've been called to be witnesses. A few um, months ago, when we started this Roman series, I... Um, I kicked it off talking about I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I had an outrageous candy bar and I should have one in my hand right now but I forgot to bring one up with me. How many of you at my, at my testimony of how great uh, an outrageous candy bar is, you went and bought one and tried it yourself? Raise your hand all across the place. Okay, you guys are losers. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> Half of the crowd in the, in the first service went and bought, they've, they've all tried it. I'm not calling you losers. I'm just saying, there is a, listen, at the testimony of what I experienced in an outrageous candy bar, people went and actually bought it and tried it. And I have not heard one person come to me and say, that was the most awful candy bar I've ever tried. I, I should have never spent the money on it. People were curious, and every testimony that I've heard back was, that was amazing. Amy, you're, you're agreeing with me. Yeah, it's good. It's very rich. It's got a lot of calories. I didn't tell people that, but, but it is good. Listen, we're called to be witnesses. At a simple witness of a testimony of, of a candy bar that I tried, and I can stand here and tell you how great it is, people will go and try it. Listen, you have a testimony of something infinitely beyond a candy bar, and that is your life has been changed by Jesus Christ. If you're a follower, a believer of him, your life has been changed. That's the reason you're sitting in the pew today. You've experienced him on some level, or you're looking and you're searching. And so today, I just want to challenge us. Listen, you have something so much greater, and you have been called to go and to be a witness, to testify of God's goodness. And as we just tell the story of what we've experienced, listen, if you're looking for a car and you have a friend, they'll tell you what, they, what, what their best experience is. If, if you know a great mechanic, that's good news to share right? There's all kinds of testimonies of what I've experienced that I can help you out with and we help each other. Why do we not share our faith the same way? Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission, Jesus said, this is some of his last words, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. The word disciple means simply learner, and Jesus said, it's our job as a church, as his followers, to make disciples. The Greek word is mate, mate tuo, which is the, simply make disciples. And, the, and it's defined like this by Strong's Concordance. It is helping someone to progressively learn the word of God, to become a matured, growing disciple, literally a learner, a true Christ follower, to train in the truths of scripture and the lifestyle required, helping a believer to learn to be a disciple of Christ in belief and practice. Now, how many of you say that sounds a little bit intimidating to me? Good, good answer. Or you just didn't know whether you should raise your hand or not. That's a big definition just to say, listen, live the life full as a follower of Jesus and make disciples and let your life be an example. You have a responsibility and that is to make disciples, make more disciples and help them grow, teaching them by being an example, teaching them, not just telling them what to do, but teaching them by example to be a follower, what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus and training them to live the same way teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Paul tells Titus in uh, Titus chapter two, verse seven, and everything set them an example by doing what is good. He said, lead by example. People are watching you. They're gonna imitate you. So as a, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, a coach, or whatever hat that you wear where you're influencing people, realize that people are watching you. And as a, as, a, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, we need to live a life that is setting that great example because we're called to make disciples. We're not just called to, 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 to reach the lost and tell them about Jesus and let, let them go. We're, we're, to, we're to walk along in life with them and, and teach them and reinforce things along the way. Euangelion, here's, here's the deal. I've got two Greek words for you today. The second word is this, euangelion, which is the Greek word for, for good news. It's the root of the word evangelism, 
which the dictionary, the dictionary defines as spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. It really literally means being a bearer or a bringer of good news. Evangelism, it's bringing good news. It's being a bearer of good news. Taking this message, the gospel message, the good news that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The message that Jesus is really real. That he lived here on this earth. That he died to pay the price for our sins. And he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And one day he's going to return for us. It's an amazing, amazing message. It's good news. And he did all that in order to have a relationship with each and every one of his creation. That's the news. That's the good news. The message that you and I as believers, as followers of Jesus, have been entrusted uh, to take to the world. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. I apologize, I'm talking real fast, but I want to get through this. Acts chapter 3 and 4, we're going to look at two days in the life of Peter and John, disciples of Jesus. Two days where they were engaged in evangelism. And uh, so we're looking at Acts chapter 3 to start with. And I I don't have these uh, on the screen, so if you don't have your Bible or if you're turning in your digital device, I'm reading the New Living Translation, Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Just listen along. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. And as they approached the temple, a man lame from his birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ and Nazarene, get up and walk. And Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. And then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized that he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. So I want to help you with context to realize where you're at in the Bible. If you turn back a page, You're in Acts chapter 2, which is the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit was poured out. You turn back another page to Acts chapter 1. And this is Jesus right before he ascends into heaven. Very last words before he goes to heaven. And this is what he told his his disciples who had gathered there with him. Acts 1-4, he says, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you look in further to verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my, my witnesses. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Chapter 2 says, when the day of Pentecost came. What does Pentecost mean? Pentecost means 50. It's a word that we, we attach a lot of different uh, perspectives to. But Pentecost literally means 50. It's 50 days after Passover. These were festivals that had been happening, part of the Jewish calendar, that were already happening. Jesus was crucified on Passover. So 50 days later, he's ascended to heaven. The disciples have been waiting for 10 days in the upper room. And this is what it records on the day of Pentecost, chapter two, verse one. All the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And it's just absolutely amazing if you skip down to verse 14. Uh, it, 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 it says that Peter stood up 
full of the Holy Spirit and began to address the crowd. And he preached the very first sermon. And at the end of that message, 3,000 people responded. And that's when the church started. 3,000 people responded to salvation through Jesus at Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. So turn the page back. Now we're, we're in chapter 3. That's where Peter and John walk into the, into the temple through the gate called Beautiful. And there's this guy who he just reached out and said, I'm just going to give you what I do have. I don't have silver or gold, but I'll give you what I do have in the, in the name of Jesus. Walk. And it says that he began leaping, praising, praising God, running around, exciting. And everybody shows up. And that's where we left off. There was a crowd that gathered. And Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. He addressed the crowd. And this is, uh, we're going to go, we're going to jump ahead to chapter 4. Peter and John were speaking to the people. They were confronted by the priests and the captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees. And these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the, Bible, teaching the people that through Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them. And since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But... Many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So just in a matter of a couple days, we've got thousands of people that have responded to Peter, who was full of the Spirit, took his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Let's read on. The next day, verse 5, the next day the council of the rulers and the elders and the teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other relatives of the high priest. And they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power and whose name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, this is what happened. It's always recording that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, and there's a boldness that comes over Peter with the Holy Spirit being full in him, that he just, he addresses thousands of people. This is Peter who denied Jesus. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. And he said, Lord, even if everybody else denies you, I never, ever, 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 ever will. And then he just turns around and does it. This is Peter. Ordinary guy, he and John, but filled with the Holy Spirit, he addresses these religious leaders and he says, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. Listen, he's bringing the good news, euangelion. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were just ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. They're looking at them going, Something may, something's different about these guys. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. There's something different. They've been with Jesus. There's something different. They're just ordinary men doing extraordinary things. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. And they decided, we're just going to tell them to shut up and get out of here. So verse 18, they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again, never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. Listen, there sh we should be so full of the spirit and the presence and the power and the life of Jesus that we say, listen, you can tell me, there, there's no way I'm going to be quiet. An outrageous candy bar is the best candy bar ever. Listen, I've experienced Jesus and there's no way that you can talk me out of it. I can tell you what I experienced. This is what I know. This is what I've come to find out to be true. And you can't talk me out of it. He's changed my life. And listen, we're not going to stop. We're not going to be quiet. There may come a time in our lifetime where we're told to be quiet. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We need to decide that right now, today. What's going to happen if a year from now they tell you, silence, no talk of Jesus? Are you going to comply? Are you going to say, listen, there's a testimony and... and what God tells me is way more important than what the government tells me to do. And I'm not going to be silent about Jesus. I am not going to be silent. All right, where am I at in my notes? 
Going back to Romans chapter 10, I, got, I really have to wrap things up. Here's the deal. We've all been sent, but we all need to grow up. We need to mature. We need to be mature followers of Jesus, and we need to make disciples. Uh, and if we're going to do that, we've got to be growing and maturing ourselves. How do we do that? Because here's the deal. You can't teach somebody something that you, that you don't know. You can't pass on something to someone else that you don't possess yourself. So the first step to grow up spiritually is to read the Bible and pray consistently. Listen, those are the top two answers to every elementary Sunday school class question that's ever been asked. The answer that you can always give is read the Bible and pray. And that sounds so simple, but honestly, that's what it is. We've got we've to be in the Word, and we've got to spend time with Jesus. Why? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus was always getting away to be alone with God. Why? Because he needed to grow. He needed time with the Father, and so do we. Spending time in prayer and in the Word. Listen, this week we have prayer and fasting. I challenge you, encourage you. Maybe that's not like the top thing on your list to do, but you're saying, look, because I'm a disciple, because of what Jesus has done, I'm going to set that time aside on my calendar. I'm going to do my very, very best to be part of that, to see God help me and change me, to make me who he wants to be. I'm going to skip down to Hebrews chapter 11. He's speaking to a group of spiritually uh, immature people. Uh, and he says this, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. There's so much more that we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and you don't seem to listen. You've been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and can't eat solid food. So did you catch that benchmark of, of, of a spiritually mature person? He said, you have been believers for so long now. You've been believers for so long, you should be teaching other people. But instead, we've got to go back to the beginning again and teach you once again. It's like a spiritual baby needing milk, stuck on milk. That's why it's vital for us to spend time with God, studying the Bible and in prayer. Why it's vital that we are filled daily with the Holy Spirit. We need to grow up. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. Listen. We're called to serve God. We're called to share the truth. We're called to be salt and light. We're called to open our mouths and be a witness. And you say, that's hard. Yeah. But when we're full of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not saying we, there's more of the Holy Spirit for us to get, but he has more of us, right? Those believers on the day of Pentecost surrendered completely to the Holy Spirit and he came and had his way and they went out and did absolutely amazing things. And I believe that God wants to do that in and through each and every one of our lives today as we open our hearts to him. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me up so that I can be the disciple that you desire me to be. Listen, we're not called just to come to church on a Sunday and sit in that same pew every Sunday and do our hour of church, check it off our list and go. You're going to leave here today in just a few minutes, and you're going to be out there all week. This is roll call. We're getting the mission. We're going to pray together. We're going to encourage each other, and then we're going to go, and we're going to be on our own. We need to encourage each other throughout the week. But listen, you're on a mission. That's what we've been called to do, to make disciples, to take the good news, to speak the good news, and to live that life. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, there's someone maybe here today. Maybe you're watching online. And you say, all this talk about good news, about what Jesus has done, I have not experienced that. I've, I don't know what it is to have a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you do, but it's been a long time and you've walked away and you don't have that relationship with Jesus. And today you would say, Pastor Jeff, I need, I need that relationship. I need that good news. I need the love of Jesus. I need his forgiveness, his grace and his mercy in my life. I want a relationship with him. If that's you in the room here, would you just raise your hand? Raise your hand and keep it raised. If that's you online, or if you're in the room, would you join me in praying this? It's a simple prayer, just inviting Jesus to come in and be your Lord. Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me of all the sin and all my past and all the things that I've done. Set me free. Clean me up. Forgive me. 
thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, and I'm excited about the life and the future that I have as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for saving and forgiving me in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, we, we, want, you to, we want you to tell us. So if you're watching online, send me uh, an email, jeff at newhope.church. It would be easy to do because we want to come alongside and help you. If you're here today in person, talk to one of the pastors on your way out. Stop at the Fresh Start Center. But here's how I want to end this, this morning. I want to just challenge you because if today um, you didn't raise your hand, you're saying, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. And part of our mission as a follower, a disciple of Jesus is to go and to make disciples. We ought to have somebody on our radar at all times. There's somebody, a friend, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, that the Lord, even today as we're talking, has put in your heart to say, that's somebody in my life. I, I, all of us need to have somebody. But today, right now, you're saying, there is somebody on my heart. There's somebody in my life. Maybe you haven't talked to them at all. Maybe you've been working on them. But today, I want to ask, if, that, if there's somebody that you already know today, I want to ask you to stand to say, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to pray on their behalf through you today to see their lives changed for eternity. So if that's you today and you know somebody, would you just stand? Somebody on your heart, and you're taking that mission to say, this week, if at all possible, I'm touching base. I'm bringing good news. I'm the bringer of good news, and I want to see their life change for eternity. Jesus, I pray that you would have your way in every life representative, every person standing in this room. God, I pray that you would intervene and draw them by your Holy Spirit, that you would interrupt their life and save them. God, that they would come to a place of feeling so empty and alone and lost that they find the hope that comes through these bringers of good news. God, would you just open doors of opportunity? Would you, would you prepare the path and that each of these would be faithful to, to be your spokesperson, to be your witness, to be a witness of what you've done in their life and just be willing to, to speak. I pray that they would experience the boldness of the infilling of the Holy Spirit in their life like they've never experienced before. We call on you. We set aside time so that we're growing, so that we can give out. God, we pray for fruit. We pray for good responses. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are on a mission, and we're going to take that message wherever we go, starting right now, while it's today, capital T. Because the day, the capital D day, of his return is very, very near. So let's encourage each other. Let's be encouraged.